particular and uh, focus efforts on discoverability instead of discovery. Um, I haven't read a lot of follow-up to uh, Ulrich University's uh, uh, strategy in this, uh, how successful it is, uh, but you know, I'll be interested to hear what others have heard uh, regarding you know, this effort and others, and whether this is uh, a possible strategy in, in uh, resource discovery. Um, it, it seems a little scary to me uh, that a library would not provide a, a discovery layer, a, a, at least as one of the options in their environment, but uh, again, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's all about linked data, I think is, uh, you know, uh, the future, I think, of, dis of discover and discoverability. Uh, I'm not an expert in linked data. I try to follow it as best I can. There are experts in the room uh, on linked data, so I'll certainly be interested to hear uh, what others think about how linked data uh, can practically be used in the library environment to expose resources. Uh, Bibframe is a big topic of conversation as libraries consider moving away from fundamental standards such as MARC toward a representation of library resources and linked data. Uh, Bibframe is the model that is currently in play and in conversation and it seems to have a great deal of momentum. So when does that get operationalized into library resource management systems and discovery services? Uh, I think that that oper operationalization will take, you know, if uh, everything follows this trajectory as it seems to be, uh, but of course things can change rapidly. I, I'm not a, you know, have a very good crystal ball. Uh, but we're not in a phase of operation and implementation now when it comes to either resource management or discovery based on uh, linked data, uh, but I think it's playing out. Um, I think that there's a lot of the universe of scholarly communications that's not possible to expose as linked data because it is proprietary. How do you, uh, how do you expose uh, content behind a firewall as open linked data? I think that's a big challenge. At least the metadata, I think, will increasingly be expected to be exposed as, as linked data. I think we'll, you know, if I can look into the future a bit, I would say that there will be a period of hybrid models where index-based discovery is supplemented by, by open linked data for discoverability um, and things that linked data is good at, such as browsing and visualization, that are harder to do in uh, pre-built indexes. Will there come a time when the tables are turned, though? Will there be a time when the uh, architecture of discovery is based on linked data and it's supplemented by indexes? Uh, so I don't know. I think that's at least one of the possibilities that I see as I look kind of a little bit further into the future. So again, interested to hear uh, others' view on kind of the relationship between linked data and indexing in, in the future. One of the topics I addressed in the white paper uh, was whether or not it's likely uh, that there will be open access uh, central indexes for discovery um, in the future. Uh, we already have open source interfaces. Um, you mentioned Bufon and Blacklight earlier, but so far no kind of comprehensive uh, discovery indexes that represent the body of scholarly literature in the way that uh, the four proprietary ones do. Uh, and in the paper, I was fairly pessimistic about that happening, uh, given the resources it takes to do that. Um, that uh, the platforms, the, the scalability, the search and technology, uh, search and retrieval technologies that are involved, and kind of more the business overhead and publisher relations involved in putting together indexes of a billion or so items from hundreds or thousands of content providers uh, kind of uh, reminds me of the MDAS days where it didn't seem very sustainable for, a, for libraries or even a group of libraries to be able to build one of these indexes uh, and the platforms that they run on. Um, 
I don't know if my mind has changed much about that in the intervening months. You know, I'm always the optimist, but this is one where it's kind of hard to be optimistic about uh, given kind of the, the threshold of resources that it takes to build one of these uh, massive discovery indexes. Will things be a bit different in this future phase based on linked data? Possibly. Uh, you know, when, when you have a universe of open link data uh, that is fairly representative and comprehensive of the, the universe of scholarly communications, then it seems more possible, but that seems like a, a kind of distant dream or hope at this point, I think. So, um, you know, so I think linked data may, may help in the process, but it's not, again, going to be a panacea that will mean that uh, the complexity and cost of creating discovery services of the power and scale and comprehensiveness that, that we expect today uh, can be done by libraries themselves and easily. Okay. Uh, will there be a time when central indexes become a commodity? Uh, I, I guess I'm not very optimistic about that. I can see glimmers of possibility uh, in the same way that standards like KBART make it easier to build open URL uh, knowledge bases. Will that scale up to creating kind of article level, full text, metadata oriented discovery indexes? I don't know, but it's something to think about. Uh, you know, uh, I'm not optimistic that it'll become a commodity, but it's at least one of the, uh, the possible trajectories. Well, and again, this is kind of out above my pay grade. Will the realm of scholarly communications shift toward mostly open access uh, in the near future? Um, we see a lot of indicators in that direction that is going to be more and more, but will it, will, what will the tipping points be where most new research is published in open access and available as open link data? And then what about all of the previously published literature? Uh, how do you retrospectively get, you know, turn things that are originally published in proprietary means and behind paywalls into open link data? So I think there's a lot of uh, you know, difficulty in imagining a future of scholarly communications that's mostly open access, but, you know, I think it will be ever more open and that I think that's what funders and, and other organizations uh, may increasingly expect as uh, the way that uh, research is, is carried out. I think that there is a promising future for the current discovery products and the next generation of those. Uh, it's, you know, this is something that I think that most academic and research libraries will want at least as one of the tools in their pocket when it comes to providing access to uh, their investments and resources. So even though I don't believe in kind of a monolithic approach to discovery, I think that this will be a, a suite of products that will continue to uh, be well adopted, that will uh, continue to advance, and the state of the art will, will improve. Uh, a lot of it hinges on what happens in scholarly communications, though. And again, that, that's a little bit beyond what, what I can speculate on. Uh, in the white paper, I, I mentioned a couple of, uh, of recommendations uh, about whether or not there's a new phase of open discovery and the things that it might address. Uh, Again, these go back to kind of short-term issues such as A and I participation, better ways of exchanging data to maybe um, eventually make it more possible to commoditize, uh, you know, central search in, uh, indexes, uh, and then of course uh, this topic that I mentioned before of the relationship between resource management and discovery, I, I think, is a important thing to talk about. NISO, I think, will never run out of things to do, but in the white paper, I, I mentioned, uh, you know, some of my thoughts about what would make sense to think about next in the realm of discovery. You know, I do think that uh, ongoing uh, phases of the Open Discovery Initiative uh, are important, uh, that the topic of open link data is a is kind of an important area of research and its relationship to discovery to explore more. Uh, Altmetrics is something that NISO is already involved in and how does that apply to discovery? How could it be better applied to discovery? Um, and again, the, 
you know, uh, you know, lots of work to do related to linked data and schema org and, and those kinds of things to supplement ongoing work. So these long-term prospects, as I said, are tied to what happens in the broader universe. Libraries don't exist in isolation. We exist in a context of technology, a context of what's happening in publishing, um, and we have to respond to that accordingly. I think that in an era when index-based discovery uh, was launched, you know, it was primarily surrounding the problem providing access to proprietary scholarly content. So should that change, I think that discover, you know, discovery would naturally respond to, to those kinds of changes, uh, to be able to fully take advantage of a realm of more open scholarship. So, um, so you know, these are some of my thoughts, but you know, my thoughts aren't the most important ones in the room. Uh, it, it's the thoughts of all of you that are participating uh, in thinking about you know, what the next phase of discovery will be in your library, in your organization, uh, whether it be a, service, uh, a discovery service provider, publisher, whatever. Uh, I think that, as I already mentioned, the current products will continue to uh, evolve. Uh, will there come a time, though, when the index-based discovery kind of reach, reaches the limit of that architecture? Uh, are we thinking about, uh, you know, what comes next in kind of fundamentally different kinds of ways? Uh, is what we have today just an interim step to what comes next? That's been my experience with every aspect of technology as I've been following it uh, in my career that we're always in this interim period between the state of the art now and something that's pretty different that's going to happen next. I've never been so good at predicting what that next thing is, but I think that's important to be thinking, to be aware that what we're doing now isn't the way that we'll always be doing it in the future. And to be kind of fleshing out those ideas, thinking about those ideas going forward. So. Uh, you know, this uh, I think is a you know critical point in time, uh, where you know we're kind of in this realm where everyone's talking about linked data. There's a lot of concerns about the limitations of index-based discovery. So you know what you know what can we talk about together um, about uh, what this future will be, or how we can help shape this future uh, to improve the relationship uh, between content and users and libraries and discovery services and content providers and, and all of that. Uh, there's uh, no easy answer, There's you know, but I kind of look forward to uh, the ideas and the conversations that might come up in, in the next couple of days. Huh, so, uh, how am I doing on time? I don't have a timepiece in front of me to see. Do we have time for questions? Okay, so let, let's do try to have some questions and conversations and less of me talking. And we have a microphone left that works that we can pass around to audience folks. Okay, see one in the back. from uh, Research Libraries UK. Um, thanks for that, that was really interesting. I, I'm particularly interested in the discoverability of open access content. And I was very struck by the comment you made about discovery being, one of the purposes of discovery is to allow libraries to maximize the value of the investment they make in purchasing content. Mm -hmm. And I guess my sort of Monday morning existential question is whether or not if we want to really a, uh, engage with the discovery of, of open access material, we have to think less about maximizing the value of the content we purchase, because obviously we're not purchasing the open access content, and more about connecting researchers and scholars with the research that they're interested in. So, of course, I agree with that. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a high ideal, I believe, to be able to operate at that level. I think that most libraries are, are face practical issues, that the body of content that their faculty members 
want and use every day are published in a certain business model and are you fulfilling the mission of supporting research by telling them, well, you know, we're not going to subscribe to those particular set of things because we have different ideals. So I think that libraries have a role to play in fostering more open scholarship, but I think that that's uh, the other side of that is the practical side where how are you going to tell a faculty member that, no, we're not going to buy this set of things that you really want because it's not open access. Uh, why don't you just publish an open access in the future and change your disciplines? I think that, w I hope that that happens over time, but, you know, I, you know, I've heard lots of, of uh, collections librarians talk about kind of the, the, the conflict between idealism and what, they, what, their, what their faculty members are asking them to, to acquire for them. So, I'm not sure that answers your question. Talks around it a bit, maybe. Uh, hi, I'm Gary Thompson from UCLA. I'm curious about um, uh, if you see a role of resource sync in um, this, in some of the problems with the API access and performance, and making open access um, materials available and special collections, primary sources, things like that that aren't part of the published record. So resource sync is. Uh, and I'm not an expert on this, is kind of the um, you know, next step of, open ac of uh, OAI PMH. And a more powerful approach that's more automatic that theoretically allows metadata and content to be more easily exchanged among content repositories. So that seems like a good use case. I mean, discovery is a good use case for that. Uh, I haven't heard of a lot of implementation of that. Uh, you know, so how how would a uh, a library that has kind of a massive archive of photograph or video, uh, you know, how you know you could set up it as a in a resource sync environment between that and other discovery services? It sounds great. Uh, I would be interested to hear if it's being implemented, uh, and maybe it's a good point of conversation to uh, have in the course of the day to. Uh, kind of better foster the, the growth of content and discovery service indexes through that mechanism. It's on? Okay. My name is Scott Pittenberg. I'm with Valdosta State University. One of the questions, and I, I, I'm starting to see this being addressed, is we've got the back end where we've collected all this data, and then the front end where we're coordinating it and displaying it to the user. And one of my best examples is you and I can both sit down at our own laptops, do a Bing search, and get completely different results because our browsers have learned, for lack of a better term. And, and I see vendors trying to overcome this, and it, it's, it's something that Roy Tennant once said, only a cataloger could love this interface because you have to go in and do all these drop-down menus, and I have to select here's what I want, here's what I don't want. And, and I see us kind of moving in that direction. Cersei Dynex used to have a product called Rooms where you created pre-coordinate searches designed for special disciplines. How do you see that transition happening versus getting the user to what they want but not excluding something that they might want, the, the serendipitous search? And I think that's going to be, do you see that as being our biggest challenge, uh, which is almost the opposite of the, the known item search? So these are complex use scenarios, aren't they? That to what extent, so I think that users who use the web ex expect this kind of personalized search results that because of the search history, it's going to kind of feature certain kinds of things that are reflected in previous behavior. Is that a good or a bad thing in a library context? You know. Researchers do different kinds of research, you know, students and researchers do different kinds of projects at different times. So in a way, it's very, very tricky to say that, well, this time we're gonna show mercury as the element and, and float that to the top, but oh, I'm writing astronomy paper now. So now I'm seeing the element and not the planet. And so it's very tricky to imply all of that but it's also very unuser-friendly to make them select all of that. 
So I think that's the dilemma. What is the right amount of personalization that a library interface ought to provide or not? Uh, what are kind of the tripwires of uh, privacy and security and all of that as well? Uh, if you start kind of collecting information about a user uh, in order to be able to improve their search, you know, that's kind of getting into slightly dangerous ground when it comes to recording preferences uh, and behavior in a way that it might conflict with library values. So it, it's tricky. Uh, great question, uh, and I think it's, again, fodder for conversation in the next couple of days, uh, something that I'm not enough of an expert in to be able to really answer well. Uh, I'm Andrew Harmon from the Endocrine Society. We're a society publisher of journals, books, clinical practice guidelines, CME, mm -hmm. many different things. Uh, and much like librarians, much like researchers, we're under, uh, publishers are under an increasing amount of p pressure uh, for either maintaining or, as we're trying to do, recalibrating our business model in the era of open access and mm -hmm. funder mandates and, and things like that. We're also under an increasing amount of pressure from advertisers, especially online advertisers, especially in the clinical publishing world. So in a very general way, what I'd ask is, in all this information and insight you've provided, is there a way to parse out your message, at least for my benefit, to a publisher? What would you say to a publisher? Because I know there are a lot of librarians or library representatives here, but what would you say to those of us coming in from the publishing side? So, no easy answer, of course. No. Right. As a publisher, you know, is an organization, a business that has to have a certain financial model in order to keep doing what they do. Uh, what happens when the rules change? When uh, for decades it's been a business model based on uh, subscriptions, and if you don't subscribe, you don't get access. Expectations are now changing so that, well, you want to provide free access, so what's the revenue stream? Is it, uh, is it author fees? Uh, is it, su is it supported through memberships of societies? You know, um, not being, you know, my area of expertise is on the, in the library technology side, not the business publishing side. So I, I understand the problem, but I don't know all the answers either. Uh, how, how do publishers continue to prosper as expectations change from proprietary publishing to open access? So I guess I'm as interested in hearing your ideas than to kind of speculate on my own. Yes. There we go. Okay. Hello, I'm Carola Della Porta from University of Milano in Italy. Um, a question is, you mentioned in the white paper and also today about hopefully the future of cross-language searching and to open up these tools to a more broader language content. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you <laughs> more about it. Uh, it's just magic, right? <laughs> Some, it's, it's a secret sauce, but ultimately what I think will happen more, you know, you can do part of it through automated means you know, having, uh, you know, there's incredibly good language translation technologies. Can that be used to cross-translate queries and results? Um, I think that will probably be relatively unsatisfying. Uh, I think that there'll be more kind of metadata uh, built uh, that at least has some standard vocabularies available in multiple languages. I think the discovery service providers are pretty motivated in this area. If they want, for example, to be able to sell their discovery services in Italy, uh, it's pretty nice for them to be able to say that, yeah, we've got good uh, localization of the interface, we have a lot of metadata that will drive the power of retrieval to, to your users. Uh, that's especially important in, in uh, non-Roman script languages, Asia, Arabic, and so forth. Uh, where you know the difficulty uh, of kind of cross searching is is even more apparent. So I think there's a lot of motivators to uh, to drive better performance in that area. 
but it's going, you know, I think the automatic algorithms will probably be an initial step. I think that people will grumble about those because they, you know, even Google Translate, as much better as it's gotten in the last few years, uh, may not be up to the kinds of uh, you know, precise language queries that are going to come up in discovery. So again, I'm, I'm the optimist. I think that there's a lot of motivation for improvement in this area. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. OK. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I think, unfortunately, we're kind of running close on time. So interesting, I saw like four hands go up. Uh, but we are kind of running into or running through our breaks. So uh, please keep the questions. Uh, we will have lots of time for discussion. So maybe write them down, and, and we'll, uh, we'll have some time this afternoon to get into those in, into more detail, or maybe during the panel discussion. So right now we've got a 10 minute, uh, we were hoping for 15 and now we have 10. Uh, but that's okay. We have coffee in, in the room next door. And uh, apologies for the live stream that's been a little wonky and we're gonna continue to work on that. Uh, but hopefully we'll have that improved by the time we get the panel going. And again, uh, we wanna get some ideas up here on the whiteboard on these uh, flip charts about conversations that you would like to have regarding midterm horizon on what should NISO do about it. So uh, also take a few seconds and come up here and write down your ideas. So thanks again, and we will reconvene at 10.30. Thank you, Marshall.
Okay. 10 minutes happens faster than you think. We can. Well, we can. Uh, actually, what no? What we'll do is we'll just kill this. We'll do the low tech. So if that if that pad of paper starts smoking, just let me know. <laughs> Is it? You can if you want. Or I. You're the general MC, but then I'm happy to do that if you want me to. Actually, can you? Okay. <clears throat> All right. A few um, a few other logistic um, things to mention, not challenges. Actually, this this one's fairly easy. For those of you who want power, there is power either under or close to every table here. So if you're missing it, there is one underneath the table. Yeah. And so what we wanted to do now is there are obviously, we don't want to stand in front of a speaker when I've got the mic. Um, what we wanted to do now is bring in some perspectives from the uh, the suppliers of index discovery services and then have them talk about some of the kind of near-term, long-term issues that they see their fa organizations are facing. So uh, we've asked Marshall to moderate this panel and so what we'll do now is just hand it off to Marshall and I'll, why don't you actually can Hopefully, does the lavalier working? Yeah. Let's try the lavalier. That way, we'll give two mics to the table. Is it really working? OK, great. So if we're ready, I'm happy to introduce the illustrious panel of representatives from the four primary primary index-based discovery service providers. Um, you have the list of names on your program. I will read off the names and, and who they're affiliated with. Um, won't go into detailed bios or anything like that. Uh, uh, pleasure to introduce uh, each of the four, beginning with Scott Bernier from uh, EBSCO. He's Senior Vice President of Marketing. Steve Gutman uh, from ProQuest, uh, Senior Director of Product Management. Mike Showalter, Executive Director, End, service, end, server, end User Services at OCLC, and Edo um, 
Pallade, uh, Vice President, Solutions and Marketing, Ex Libris, North America. So each of the panelists, beginning with Scott, will talk for a few minutes uh, with their kind of prepared remarks. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the clicker was Uh, this one seems to be working. All right, good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the time. Um, we were asked to just uh, talk a little bit about uh, where we stand or give a little bit of an overview uh, of uh, the world as we see it in the discovery space. Certainly in uh, four minutes, I should be able to do that very well. Um, so I just uh, sort of picked a couple of, a couple of topics to sort of key in on that, um, that are covered uh, within Marshall's paper to get some dialogue going. Hopefully, that's the, uh, the idea for today. First of all, I think it's wonderful that NISO is doing this. I think it's a great thing to see publishers and libraries and vendors come together. Um, I think maybe in this space, in the space of discovery, that's the, it, it allows us to all sort of reach toward the same goal. You know, publishers want to see content usage. Libraries want to support those users. And how can we uh, see that content and that, those materials and the work that we do uh, rise to the surface and have real value for the users. And certainly from a vendor, uh, a, a product provider, or technology provider, you know, how can we optimize the value of those resources? And so uh, all have the same goals, which is a great place to be. Uh, how we do that and how it manifests, I suppose, are the, are the real questions at hand. So from our perspective, we sort of when you start to think about discovery, you start to just think larger. You know, how can we make sure that discovery is really about your entire collection? You know, we talk a lot about, you know, the ILS and how that factors in, and, uh, but really think about the whole world of the suite of resources that you're trying to provide, and how can we make a discovery service that actually does that? It's a lot of hurdles, but it's bigger than the catalog, it's bigger than uh, the databases, it's bigger than the journals, it's all those things put together. But really, the idea, too, is how is this about every one of your users? So in some way, shape, or form, certainly, you know, so, uh, a, a sophisticated user, as Marshall talked about, is gonna go to a sophisticated resource and wanna use those. But how, if they come to your discovery service, can you expose those? Can you expose the value of the library beyond what they thought they were coming to see in a, in a powerful way? So consider it for every user, consider it for your, your faculty, and so on. And then uh, certainly the goal, of ensuring the long-term success of the library. And I think that's a, a combination of factors. So when we think about that from an EBSCO perspective, it's about, not so much today, we like the idea of the long-term view. Where is the library going to be? We all want it to be successful. How can we come together to enable that success? What does it mean in the future? What does it mean now, but where do we need to go? And so a lot of that is about the perception of the library. We talk about usage and we talk about the value of the content and the services that you provide. But what did it mean to the user who came to your library, used a service, and said, you know, that was great, and want to come back? And that, I think, there's a gap there. You know, we were talk just talking with someone just now about how do we get the right stuff in front of the user, the right time where they may exist, and then when they come to the library and they authenticate and they finally get in there and then they have to learn something new and, well, how do we make it so that it's better and easier for them so they go, I'm coming back. Maybe I'll tell my friends. And so that's some of the stuff that we want to figure out. This day is really focused around discovery more than anything else, and, and this I thought was a really great quote. Um, from Texas A&M, but the discovery layer provides the first experience most users will have with the library website, and it's critical for that defining moment to be successful. And you know, that's, I think, the, the critical piece of this. It's about the user's experience. All the tools and all the services and all the stuff that we do in the library space or what we're trying to do to, uh, to build better services is about the user. It's where your 
That's where you're focused. That's where the university's focused. It's where the libraries are focused. How can we make sure that that thing is as good as it can be so that they do come back, so that they don't say, what's up with the library? Why is it so odd? Why can't I get what I need? This was a slide that was used at an ODI presentation uh, back in January, I believe, from the dean of libraries at Wichita State, who was talking about his strategic goals from the library perspective. It's about the user experience. So when we think about it from the EBSCO perspective, certainly it's, it's, a, it's a large undertaking, or, or, but uh, we want to uphold the quality. So there's this idea of you know, discovery services. Well, it's sort of the, the great uh, l large stuff, but not super precise. How do we get a, library, a user in there to find exactly what they need? If this is my entire collection, how can I make sure that the right stuff is surfaced to the right user at the right time? There's a lot that goes into that, but that's sort of where we're thinking is about precision. It's about precision in search. It's about making sure that that thing was the right thing. What is it? How do we get there? It's a little bit, little bit harder. We're, we're thinking on the relevancy ranking and the index side, really along the same lines as Marshall talked about. How do we get to where we need to be from the index side and then add the, uh, the technologies as we move forward on the linked data side and how does that really get a user to what they need and realize the value of a library? And a lot of that is about discovery. I mean, excuse me, user experience. So more and more, discovery is that first place that users interact with the library. It's, that, it's becoming that spot on your, on your website. It's becoming that window to the world of your collection. And so we want to increase the usage. And certainly then, how do we then, when you find the right thing, how do we get them to it in the best possible ways? There's lots of thoughts around that. But I think more, maybe more than anything is that as we build these things out as vendors, uh, we want to do that with your goals in mind, and every library is unique. And so how do we build out services that play well with other services that you have and goals that you have? So how does a library customize what they can, and how do these things interoperate among each other? So that the choice and your needs are met, and that you can do the things that you need to do to pick and choose what's right for you, and make sure that that all works well. So a quote from the paper that we're here sort of swirling around. Uh, Marshall says, libraries often have an interest in the ability to use their preferred discovery service regardless of the resource management platform in use. I think it's bigger than that as we think about this. How do all the system and systems and services and tools that we have interoperate? And how can we get to a point where they're working well so that it's not about should a discovery service work together with your LMS or should it be tight coupling? Or it's the idea that, hey, you know, I should evaluate everything that I have in the library, and from a technology perspective, wouldn't it be ideal if these all worked well together? So it wasn't about, well, I bought that, so I have to use this, or wait, I'm using this and it's really good, but if I want to use that, I, I, ah, those things don't work well. So from a technology perspective, the tools are kind of there and APIs and things to get us in a position where the choice should live with you. You should evaluate, choose, build the best services that you can based on what's available to you. And there's really nothing to stop that so it's this kind of idea where every library has a unique set of services. And what we want to try to do is to say, no matter what you choose and what you think is important and what the best services are for you, you should have the same uh, approaches or the same opportunities as every other library, no matter what your services are. So if you think one thing is the best and you pick and choose each of your items, they should all work really well together. That's one of the things that we want to try to do is to make sure that everyone has that equal footing. And this is sort of given that in a, in a big picture. And we talk about you know, integration with the discovery in your LMS, but it's bigger than that. Where do I order my books? Where do I, how do I get my journals? How does that interact with my discovery service? How does, when I order a book, how does it become known immediately to my holdings management and then also appear directly in my discovery and also send that information over to the ILS? You know, how do these things interrelate? And so our goal is, and we think that as you think about discovery being the entire collection, the idea of an open environment that allows for this interoperability and puts the choice in your hands is where we want to try to go, at least from the EBSCO perspective. So all these kind of things, and there's lots, and it's just a diagram, but to, to start to understand and to think about all this stuff should be swirling around. It's bigger than, hey, can I use my discovery with my, I, uh, my LMS of choice? Well, you should be able to, and it should work technically, but it also should work across your entire uh, ecosystem. So simply, uh, you know, where are you trying to go, and how can we as vendors help you to get there? And sort of from our perspective, just the idea of an open concept 
where you choose what you want, and we work together to help to optimize that. And the technologies and the approaches are certainly the things that we get dive deeper into, but I thought this would be a, a good way to open the conversation. So thank you. Thanks. Oh, is it queued up? All right. Cooking with uh, whatever. Uh, great. Well, thank you very much. I'm Steve Gutman. I'm the Senior Director of Product Management at ProQuest. Uh, I cover Summon, uh, 360 Link, the Intoda products, and I'm the veteran of numerous companies and lots of software. And one of the one of the issues that um, has always been interesting to me that I thought I might give you a little glimpse into is how software architecture, how software products are put together, implies or reflects policy and, and philosophical decisions uh, with respect to to products. And I thought I would relate some of the things that we do with Summon uh, to the Open Discovery Initiative and. Um, some of the philosophies behind that. Okay. Hmm. This doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Good. Okay. So when <laughs> when we talk about summon, uh, when I talk about summon, I, I I sort of talk about three main pillars, uh, extensible and reliable coverage, uh, making sure that we have enough content that covers what your library subscribes to and, and is in your, uh, your catalog, embedded librarianship, the ability for librarians to add value to the search experience through things like the uh, database recommender and best bets feature, and democratic discovery and access guide me to the best possible resources, uh, no matter who they come from. So if you read the um, Open Discovery Initiative, it's really about two things. It's about transparency, and it's about fairness. So transparency, help me understand why we get the results that we get, help me understand what uh, your content coverage is, and fairness, well, fairness is, is about allowing uh, each provider, each piece of content to have an equal choice of being found uh, 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 through a search. Why is that important? Well, most people believe that a library shouldn't be a walled garden and shouldn't reflect the, um, the viewpoint or the content choices of a, of a, of a single vendor. And because ProQuest is both a discovery provider and a content provider, uh, we feel this issue you know, very keenly. And we've done some things technically to allow this to, uh, to occur. Uh, I like to call it democratic discovery. So the, the way that all these discovery engines work, as, as Marshall has pointed out, is there's a big index hooked to a knowledge base. The index contains uh, what we call commercial content from aggregators and publishers, open access content, library catalog, institutional repositories, all kind of indexed together uh, in a, and, and sort of back-ended by uh, typically hundreds of different servers. And if you look at Summon, there's a huge amount of content in here, 2.5 billion records, it's something like 20% open access content, 50% commercial content, uh, and the rest is, is library uh, bibliographic records. And the interesting thing is that about 25% of this content uh, are duplicates. And so the question is, well, how do you treat those duplicates, and how do you ensure that each vendor has their version of a particular piece of content seen. Now there's some subtle points here. So consider 
So the Open Discovery Initiative says you should not favor any providers. So if you have um, an article from Nature, for example, which is provided four, uh, uh, four times in your subscriptions, say from ProQuest, EBSCO, Thomson Reuters, uh, Gale, ideally what you would like is for each of those providers, uh, well, if you, for a given search, for the content views from each of those providers to be equal. So it seems like that should happen naturally, uh, but it doesn't. Why doesn't it? Because the records aren't necessarily equal. So as, a, as an aggregator, as a content provider, we, as well as EBSCO and, and other providers, we enrich the metadata for each of the records that, that we publish. We use controlled vocabularies, we add additional uh, subject terms, we may uh, enrich uh, the content in other ways. And so what ends up happening is that one record has the richest metadata, and in almost all um, situations, that's the one that will rise to the top, and that's the one that you will see most frequently, if not um, all the time. So how do we deal with that? Well, with Summon, what we've done is to, okay, <laughs> with Summon, what we've done is to create a, a technology that we call match and merge, which basically takes all these duplicate records and creates a merged record from the individual record that combines all the subject terms uh, and combines a lot of metadata. And it's this merged record that we actually go through and index. So in this particular uh, example I have here, which you, which you can't read, there's actually uh, 21 different records, 21 different pieces of information that have gone to create this merged record. So we merge the metadata and then we add um, abstract and extra subject terms, uh, DOIs from Crossref, et, et cetera. And this is what we go through and index. So when you do a search, what you find is the relevant merged record, which then goes back and points to all of the original records, which are then sort of all given an equal chance to be seen. Again, kind of democratic discovery. What happens uh, potentially with other systems is that, as I mentioned, the record with the greatest or richest metadata is the one that almost consistently gets seen because it's perceived by the relevance engine as being the most relevant. So ProQuest is committed to the Open Discovery Initiative, to providing transparency, to providing uh, fairness in linking, and to providing uh, fairness among all co content providers uh, uh, to be discovered. And we have um, uh, both blog posts and our uh, con conformance checklist posted on the website, and you should feel free to, um, to take a look at those and be happy to take any questions later. Thanks. I thought for some reason Steve's presentation had that Ravens logo in it, and he was going to make a <laughs> reference to <laughs> one of those local references that everybody tries to do. Uh, I'm, I'm Mike Showalter. I'm executive director of end user services at OCLC. Uh, I actually used to have uh, Steve's job, so I, I, I think I could have maybe done those slides. Um, <laughs> I've worked for three of the vendors that are up on the panel here today. <laughs> Uh, OCLC is, um, is a, a little bit of a different experience. Uh, it is a, a global library cooperative. Uh, we provide uh, shared technology services, original research, community programs. Our research team is pretty amazing. Uh, they've delivered a lot of great research that all vendors have used over the years. Um, and so to finally meet those people was kind of a, 
you know, great moment for me because I've stolen all their slides many times. Um, and, you know, the, and one of the differences here is that, um, you know, our, our CEO, Scott Pritchard, he does report, in fact, to a board, a governing board of OCLC, most of whom are librarians, not all of them, apparently, uh, but most of them are. Uh, and, you know, we together were supporting the access to the world's collective knowledge. And we deliver a lot of different services, cataloging, for example, metadata, uh, discovery is just one of them. But when you look at, um, when, you know, I, when I was digging around for slides to use here, I, I found this, somebody had put this together some time back. And it's really interesting because it not just include, it, it's definitely OCLC focused for sure. I mean, three decades of innovation that's focused on us. And yet when you look at the list here, there's, some, uh, there's other companies represented. And it kind of gave a little bit of a historical perspective here. And this was one of the interesting moments for me because when I walked in the door, one of the products that I was actually in charge of, they told me, was First Search. And I graduated from the University of Washington uh, uh, I School in 1992. And First Search was launched in 1991. And if you'll recall, First Search was one of the first, if not the first, I'm not sure if Dialog, Dialog may have been, but you know, it was the first per search, uh, um, uh, uh, per search fee product, right? You had to pay per search at that time. And that was a really innovative business model. I think Dialog made a lot of money off of that over, over the years. And so when you look at that, but when you look at over the time, what's happened is, you know, end user access, that was really like in the, in the 90s started happening. And then the web came along in a big way and you were able to move to the web. So visibility on the web became the next thing. And uh, OCLC, one of the things they did was a worldcat.org got introduced in 2006. And that uh, made the you know, worldcat completely exposed to the open web for Google to crawl it. Uh, uh, Bing didn't, didn't exist at the time, Yahoo. Uh, and, then became, and then the next model was a uh, single search for global discovery. And that was where you know, we all kind of like came into it around the same time. OCLC says uh, that uh, Primo was at 2007. I'm not sure if it's, you know, the exact dates are here are correct. WorldCat Local was in fact uh, a, a great catalog to offer local and global discovery. Put WorldCat together with your local collections. And then Summon came out in 2009, of course, and so on. Um, uh, library links to a connected world. You know, that's sort of like when you look at what Marshall was presenting up there, a little bit of what we're kind of trying to talk about here is, is what's the next step? Because if we, th if we say we're in this current model at that single search for global discovery, but at the same time, what, I, what you see, he presented one slide which was uh, related to the, uh, the bento box idea, so that user experience. And so, in fact, four vendors are providing this single search product and then libraries are going in and actually deconstructing it. And so, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a, a disconnect on maybe on some of the goals, maybe that's local uh, views that they're kind of trying to take a look at. But in fact, maybe they're actually responding to a real need there, which is from an end user perspective, in some cases, it's not always the single search box that ends up being the best, uh, best use case. And that was a big revelation for me, in fact, was with First Search, what I came into was, it turns out there's still a lot of great use cases that are supported by First Search itself. In the second, it's like, I think it's V2, which I think was launched uh, uh, late 90s maybe. And so it, there's still some great use cases in there that in fact libraries tell us over and over again that from a discovery perspective for some of them and for some of their students, that's gonna be the great uh, discovery experience for them. So you never know like exactly like there's a great diversity here of what can be done and uh, perhaps what should be done. Uh, World Cat, of course, is at the center of what we do. Uh, it's the collective knowledge base of uh, uh, primarily monographs, but a lot of other content, too, in there as well. Maps, digital objects, and so on. About 350 million records, 2.3 billion holdings. This goes back for a long time, and this is really the OCLC when they first started. I, I know that you may have seen the news that we actually printed our last library catalog card uh, the other day, which was the original discovery system, by the way. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a big data store that is, uh, you know, represents the collective holdings of everyone and all libraries kind of have a, a real need to be able to, co to, uh, to connect to this. When you look at WorldCat Discovery Services, it, it, you know, to kind of like follow on, there's no point in belaboring the point. They are very similar. It's a, you know, it's a, you know, we have, we combine WorldCat, our big uh, monograph collection with the central index with the WorldCat knowledge base. These are kind of like table stakes for everybody to be able to actually deliver a service like this. Uh, we're at about two billion. Um, you know, how you count is, uh, you know, they all roll up a little bit differently. Uh, major publishers represented, ProQuest, EBSCO, Gale, uh, uh, eBrary, Ingram, and so on. We, we've got all of those, and we track about 12,000 different packages, I believe, on the east side. 
where we kind of start differing is kind of the approach that's been taken by OCLC over the last uh, few years is, you know, visibility for library collections outside, outside these library discovery services. And this is where, when I see, you know, when I look at the opportunity for all of us to work together, this is one of the places where we should be, like, looking at because it turns out that users, in fact, don't always start at the, uh, at the library homepage. In fact, we found, o our OCLC research has found that almost none of them do. They start just like everybody else starts with Google. And um, so we've got visibility out there via our worldcat.org uh, syndication product. Other, other uh, more than 50 different um, uh, providers that are out there, we've got some sort of a, uh, a, um, a, a business deal with them, give them access to our search API, allow them to integrate WorldCat uh, um, uh, resources into their products. Uh, in addition, we're a leader in, in linked data resources. OCLC uh, has been uh, driving the conversation of that over a number of different years. We've got uh, billions of RDF triples that have been, have been put out there. WorldCat Works, Fast, uh, VOF, uh, WorldCat Catalog, uh, Dewey, uh, these are all linked data resources, uh, content stores that we've released out there and, and, and uh, libraries and other uh, third party providers are, are using them. And this is just an example of like when you actually dig into uh, the linked data, sh kind of showing exactly how we've done that using schema.org, being able to show the, like the full breadth of what's there and pulling out and parsing apart the bits and pieces of, of, uh, of these data records that are really important for discovery purposes. Uh, and, you know, going on with that, we're able to, we're understanding workflow requirements, we're working with the Library of Congress and the Bibbrain community, we've got a pilot program coming up working with a, a number of different universities uh, to move some of those linked data initiatives forward. Thank you. Hey everyone. Can you hear me? Oh, okay. I wasn't sure because I, you know, I, um, and here are my slides. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Todd, Juliana, and everyone else for organizing this. This is really uh, quite an event. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some great discussions over the last couple of days. Special thanks for Marshall for being able to pronounce my name properly. Um, yeah. No, it's, it was good. Um, I, I sort of wanted to talk about something else. I, I read the title, The Future of Library Resource Discovery, and I, I didn't want to talk much about Exlibris. I didn't want to talk much about Primo. Um, I sort of want to talk more about the future, or what are the different possibilities. Um, so when you look at even how you develop product roadmap, you're always trying to assess a few different angles. So I picked up three of them. Um, first one being the obvious one, user experience, library patron experience, any way you want it. Um, we're just starting, I think, to understand the impact. How many of you actually have mobile devices? How many of you wake up in the morning and the first thing you do while your head is still tilted actually read your emails? <laughs> Not a very good uh, way to open up your day, but um, our company is based in Israel, so by the time I wake up, I have about seven hours of emails um, already logged in, so it's quite the experience. I think. The mobile, you know, everyone's talking responsive design. Responsive design, in a way, is something that is, I wouldn't call it basic or mandatory, but it's obvious. I think we're starting to grasp what can mobile devices actually do. Think of the comment of this following scenario. You walk by the university library, and the phone issues an alert based on your location, an iBeacon saying you have a book ready for you to pick up. It is not something that's far away from us. Think about these kind of activities, and that's exactly the direction I believe we should be taking. So if you take the mobile, if you take the personalized experience, these are the two of them. If you combine them together, the options are just unbelievable to what can be done through these devices. They somehow sit on the border, if you look at it, between um, the information one can store about an individual and between the user actually allowing to build that data. So unlike, you know, I always give the example when I type in Google, I type in curry. Um, it auto-completes the curry house, which is a restaurant down the street from me. I, I don't think libraries are able or will be able because of personal issue, privacy issues to actually get to that level. But I do believe that over time, even, you know, you search for something in your discovery system, it simply asks you the question, do you mind just listing one or two things about yourself? And over time, 
proactively collecting information so we can in indeed provide a more personalized experience. And then, of course, relevancy ranking will become um, more efficient, more relevant to each individual member. The other component is explorative. Um, you've mentioned, Marshall, in your talk, known item searching. I always ask, what are known items? If I type in predictably, then a reality. I definitely know what I'm looking for. I just can't remember the second word of that book, predictably rational. So is that a known item? I think it is. But is this something we define as a known item? Typically in the library world, we define a known item as you enter the title. And that's, that's one scenario, but the scenarios are very different. So when I look at explorative, and one of the things we're trying to do more and more is think a user found something that they were interested in. From that point on, we sort of have an anchor, and we can bridge out to other relevant resources, whether it's leveraging linked data, whether it's leveraging even library cataloged information, whether it's leveraging you know, usage data. But, but it's very important that we understand that sometimes just one item is not enough, even if it's the item you were looking for, but we need to provide a whole e ecosystem, I would say, uh, to provide more resources. So that's on the library patron experience. The other component is technology. Um, technology is not the goal. It's the, the means to the end, I would say. Sometimes we get confused. We get excited. I, I'm a computer science major myself. I like to talk about technology. Um, but technology are simply tools for enablement. And they should allow us to simply provide better services to our patrons and better services even internally. So analytics was mentioned here, definitely in, you know, insightful analytics, how we make decisions, not just about collection development, but also how do we make decisions, and it, it correlates to what was said here, um, in customizing the user interface. Which facets do I choose to have um, in my discovery solution? What will be the relevancy ranking of my local content, archival materials, and online articles? How can I make these decisions? Um, one way to do it is by having a committee. I know we all like committees. Uh, we do committees ourselves, even in Ex Libris. Um, and committees are wonderful because they grab information from multiple constituents with different views. But an, an interesting way may also be insightful analytics, understanding the patron and how they use their patterns of searching, their pa patterns of actually selecting different components. So that's something that I believe over time we'll see more and more. The second component, as I say, in linked data, and again, linked data is a tool. Linked data is a tool to provide users with more relevant resources that they're looking for. And also, of course, expose it so they'll be able to find it in different places. And then the third component will be new means of interaction. Um, I don't uh, have Kinect or Xbox. I know some do. Uh, but when you think of these tools, they don't, you, you're not, you, you hardly even have a remote control these days. You wave at your screen to even flip a TV. If you have Samsung Smart TV, by the way, you should try that. It's pretty fun. I know for some of us, it may be not our first nature. It's sort of a second nature that we have to adopt to. But this is what students, this is what patrons are starting to get used to it. So what new means of interaction can we expect? New means of interaction can be, of course, talk to your phone to find resources, complain to your phone chat with a librarian, FaceTime a librarian, not sure we have enough librarians worldwide to support that. But we need to understand what are students, researchers expecting, what kind of services are they expecting, and how do we provide those from the discovery solution. And then the third component is the industry. Um, Mike here said he worked for um, three vendors already. Mike, you're more than welcome. Um, <laughs> Not for my job, though. <laughs> 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 I know you got Steve's already. I mean, let's, let's keep mine. But I, I think we're a close enough community um, to facilitate collaboration. I think the ODI um, is a first step. I think there'll be more steps to follow through. One of the concepts I think we need to introduce is a market space, which unlike a marketplace, uh, so there's a very big difference. Marketplace is vendors, like ourselves here in a panel, coming and pitching more or less each of our products, we do it through RFIs, we do it through on-site visits, etc. A market space is a place where there's a dialogue. 
there's an understanding of what the requirements are and then responsibility on our side to actually commit to those and develop them. Um, one of the things I was personally excited, and yes, this will be the, the one marketing spiel I do about Exlibris, is we actually created an ideas market space where everyone can come and they can say, I'd like to submit this as an enhancement request. And other members, not necessarily product, um, not necessarily subscribers to our products can come and they can vote and they can enrich. Um, if you have some time later today, not while we're talking, um, go to ideas.lego.com um, and try and look at that. It's, to me, that's what elevated Lego from a, an old kid's sort of, you know, um, building blocks to a modern um, company where they actually talk to the customer. And the interaction there is unbelievable. What basically it facilitates, it facilitates a much closer community. That we're not just developing and us throwing ideas at you, throwing functionality, but it's actually a close collaboration of what you need and how can we respond to it. The second component would be local and global data. Uh, and it's mentioned here a lot by local and global. I sort of mean local, the um, unique materials that each institution holds. And then the global are things that will be shared through central indexes. The, the importance of local data, I think, will never diminish, at least in my opinion. And I think it's even stronger, you know, when we talk about online articles, that's right. Most users will start from Google, Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic. But ask yourself, if I know that I'm interested in actually in a book, in an archival material, or in a, you know, um, resource that's specific to my institution, I might actually start with the library first. So that's just one interesting thought of how can we expose those and make sure that they're being highlighted. And the third component mentioned here quite, off, quite a lot, I don't need to talk about it more, open access, um, how can we help promote it in a way that's easier for all maybe institutions to use, not necessarily whether they subscribe or not, how can we help um, encourage industry, uh, whether to use more or less. Um, but I think with open access, as mentioned here, there's, and, and there was a good question from the audience, how can we also find a business model from vendors that you know provide service to it um, and from publishers, and how can we work together to make it more viable for all parties? And that was it. Thank you, guys. Okay, so <laughs> we can distribute ourselves a little bit. We're not looking at slides as much, but they're uh, uh, only because the questions are on it and I don't have them memorized <laughs> or in front of me otherwise. Okay, so go ahead and find the next presentation. Do I, do I have a way to do this myself? The Panel questions? Do you have a deck there? Right, so, which is fine. So while we're doing that, I want to thank Scott, Steve, Mike, and Ito for uh, very interesting summaries and, and topics presented. Uh, once we get the questions up, I've got uh, you know, four questions or so that I dreamed up that I've given each uh, of the panelists uh, a chance to to look at. Oops. Oh. Uh, th th those are them. Yeah. 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 So go ahead and put it in presentation mode. Uh, wherever the clicker is, it will help me guide through them. Where's the clicker now? No, I didn't see anything. It's okay. uh, just uh, under the uh, between the uh, TV and the. Uh, ah, I see. The massive TV. Okay, so I've got some questions that I dreamed up that the panelists have had a chance to look at in advance. Uh, but we're also interested in, in your questions. So maybe we'll kind of alternate between the questions that, that I presented, uh, ones that any of you might have, questions the panelists might have for each other. Uh, we've got, I think, about 45 minutes, yeah, for discussion between now and lunchtime. So, We'll go on with my, my first question, uh, and which is how 
Is your organization approaching narrowing the gap of library-oriented resources not yet re represented within your discovery service? Do you perceive improvement in participation by content providers as a result of the Open Discovery Initiative? So kind of a broad general question. Uh, let's go down the line in the original order uh, and then mix it up as you have questions for each other. Uh, I'm not hearing it anyway. Uh, yeah. Is it, not only does it have to turn green, but it takes a couple of seconds of activity before it kicks in. Hello. Ah, very nice. Uh, to answer the, fir the last question first, um, I think ODI certainly has brought visibility to the, uh, to the topic of uh, content participation across discovery services, um, which is great. I'm proud to be a member of the standing committee. Um, I think fundamentally the issues around content um, participation are really about understanding the specific issues of those who may not be participating. What are your concerns, and how can we help to address those concerns? Everybody, whether you're a publisher or a, an a and provider or a, a database provider, you have a unique set of data, you have a unique set of concerns, and uh, you know, from a discovery vendor perspective, we create our services differently, and so they leverage different types of data in different ways. And so if you're built on, you know, certainly things are evolving, uh, as Marshall talked about this morning, and where are we going, but um, you know, from an EBSCO perspective, we, we put a lot of emphasis on, on subject indexing and, and leveraging uh, that data and actually using elements of uh, open data concepts, or excuse me, link data concepts to, to build out uh, links behind the scenes on control vocabularies toward uh, uh, creating better user experiences. So I type in a search, I didn't type in the one that that uh, term was indexed by or subject indexed by, but I found the right material anyway because of the the, the work that we're doing to enhance that data. But uh, I think as you, as you kind of start to understand, so if I'm an A&I provider and my world is built around subject indexes and I don't have full text to share perhaps, and I send my data and, and to a service that leverages full text in a heavy way, I may not get the value out of the, you know, my resource. And so how do, I, how do we overcome that? How do we understand what those concerns are? Even in worlds of when we combine combine uh, metadata and combine records to have a single record, there's a, there are different needs, right? So if I'm a full text provider, if my, if my goal in participating in discovery as a publisher is to drive more traffic to my full text, great, I don't care how you got there, and if your service is great, it doesn't really matter what the record was, as long as you got me to my, that full text, then that's wonderful. But as an A&I provider, it may be different. Maybe I don't want my stuff to be combined in with others. How do I get recognition? So there's different values and, and different approaches. And so from my perspective, it's really understanding the fundamental needs and goals and issues of those who might not be participating and figure out collectively the ways that we can uh, leverage that data and leverage that content and address those issues in a way that's going to be fruitful uh, for all of those involved. OK, thanks. Steve. Well, what he said. Um, oh, come on. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> not fair. <laughs> So first of all, I, I actually, can you hear? I think so. Okay. I think so. Um, I, I agree with Scott. One of the great benefits of ODI has been building and bringing awareness of discovery and all the different aspects of it um, to the public, to content providers, um, and uh, as such, it, it kind of keeps us honest. We have content providers saying, oh, where are those reports that are specified by ODI? Oh, we're, we're working on them. Um, so awareness has been a, a big element of it. I, I, I kind of want you to appreciate, though, the amount of work that goes into building uh, these indexes. So when we work with content providers, you know, we have to have legal agreements with them, which if you worked with lawyers, you know how time consuming that can be. We review samples, we work to map uh, their metadata to the sum and schema, we uh, set up a, a regular harvesting of their data. So, uh, so it's a tremendous amount of work and what it means is that with sort of a fixed number of resources, uh, you have to decide who you want to work with and what is the most important content to, to get into the index in any given period of time. So for us, uh, you know, 
adding content to the sum and index is, is a strategy. And we look to our, um, our customers to tell us, you know, what is the content that you're looking for that you want to subscribe to that's not in the index. We look in particular to uh, the different regions around the world where we don't have as much content in different languages uh, as, as we do in English. And, you know, increasingly, as I mentioned, we look to the open access sources for, um, for the kinds of information that customers want to see in the index. Uh, yeah, both both Scott and uh, and Steve made some great points, and especially from the um, you know both ProQuest and EBSCO are, are are publishers, content providers themselves, so they've got you know a, a little bit sometimes a little bit of a different view. OCLC does not is not a content provider, other than I would say WorldCat. The WorldCat database is in fact is a big content database, obviously, you know, and that in fact as far as narrowing the gap, you know, that's where we directly have an impact uh, across all libraries because uh, as we um, uh, uh, as we get new customers around the world, uh, th we start adding new things to the to WorldCat that maybe weren't there before. And I think when you look at this, right where we're at right now, when you look at these indexes and the size of them, it really kind of comes down to the case that we're really kind of like moving down the long tail now. And and it is in fact the case. So the ODI, the the awareness has been, I think, has been a big deal, but not necessarily across the world, right? So it could be that when you go to Russia. Um, that no one's heard of it. A publisher has not heard of it, and now, in fact, those are the, the publishers you're you're primarily dealing with. Is is downstream from from English content, and in some cases, uh, uh, languages that have very few uh, readers at the end of the day. And so, um, it is still the case that um, in uh, that some content shows up on a, a hard drive or a, a DVD, and uh, people then have to parse it out of whatever it was in. So there's a lot of labor involved in doing it, and as you work with the smaller publishers, the technology uh, hurdles to get there uh, are in some t cases more or bigger and more of a barrier than the than the uh, the contractual issues, which uh, obviously with any kind of publishing contract can always be uh, an issue. So when we look at it, I think that it's like it, it, part of it is that we solve some of this with remote database access. It's it's not necessarily all in one index. We do have some things where. You can't get the content. There's no good way to integrate it. We do an allow remote database capability. Um, we really do focus on extending out where we've got, where our, our uh, libraries are located. So it could be Japan, it could be Russia, wherever the, they might be. That's a, kind of some of the content that we're going to be focused on on closing that gap. Okay. Yeah. Maybe just to, um, to close. I think expectations are pretty high, which is wonderful. Um, Looking at the amount of years we have discovery solutions out there, we're talking Primo's, in your slide, Primo's 2007, someone 2009, EBSCO came right after as well. Uh, I think within four years, we've, we've sort of, our demands are for everything, which I think is wonderful, and now we gotta start building back. And I think it's a gradual process. Even for us at Ex Libris, uh, when you look at the Primo Central Index and how we continue and add more resources over time, so when, when we talk about knowing the gap um, of unsubscribed content, I would say time is something we need to consider. Um, just looking at the last couple of years with, with even the ProQuest agreement we had to um, index all the ProQuest Central and other databases as well. We signed an agreement with YBP and EBSCO um, on ebook, streamlining um, real-time acquisition. So these things are starting to, um, starting to become more real. And I think over time we'll see, I'm, I'm maybe I taking off you, Marshall, I'm becoming optimistic, um, which is not in my nature, but <laughs> um, I'm becoming more optimistic over time as, as I see these agreements actually um, make it through. The, the other component that I'd like to say is that competition is sometimes good. You don't want to have just one person in this panel sitting um, saying, you know, this is what we'll do and that's it pretty much and good luck. So I think there is a, um, there is the notion of you know, the fact that you have choices, the fact that we ha always have to be on our, on our best efforts, continue, evolve, create new things, learn from other industries on how can we improve patron services, I think that goes a long way and I think it should hopefully it remain that way as well. Okay, great. So do you have questions for each other? Any points you want to press?
Not on this one, but okay. So let's go to questions from the audience. So is there a question that you would ask one or more of the panelists right here? <coughs> uh, microphone, please. Uh, there. Yeah. Okay. Um, the library, oh, I'm Deborah Slinglaw from Johns Hopkins Libraries. Um, the library market is not a huge market. And what I really wonder is um, understanding that competition is good is are the, are the individual vendors resourced well enough to actually deliver a product that we need? And is it, I mean, in, in reality, are we gonna see more mergers? Uh, we're gonna see more heads working together or do you think you can work together in this market space and uh, still develop products that can meet our users' needs. Yeah. Okay. Everybody in Dublin, Ohio, probably terrified that I picked up the microphone first on that question. <laughs> <laughs> stay on script, Mike. Stay on script. Um, hey, I think that's a. I think it's a great question, and I think it actually opens up a kind of a bigger conversation here about discovery in general. I mentioned, for example, that bento box example of where four vendors have been building out this kind of unified user experience and a central index for each of the products, and then libraries have then gone and deconstructed them uh, for their own means. And in fact, when you look out there at the library landscape, what I see are hundreds, in some case thousands, of sort of experiments. And, I, and by experiments, I mean they, we don't always know what's right. And if you just take the four products here, multiply by all the customization options that each of them offer, the differences in the content that are in the indexes, and then add in something like a bento box or a different user experience, and suddenly we've got thousands of experiments going on where um, our end users may be succeeding and they may in fact be failing, but we don't always know what's going on. And so I think that you, know, it's a, you raise a really great point because it may be that the industry, uh, the, the investment in these four products has, have been, has been substantial. And uh, I've worked on a couple of them myself. I know what they are. Uh, it's, it's not easy. And, uh, and just the index sizes alone create a lot of economies of scale issues related to the f how you fund that. And uh, so that going back to that previous question about how, how do we close the gap, well, in some cases, maybe you don't or you do it in a slightly different way uh, just because it may not make economic sense to keep adding things in there. So I'm, I don't have a great answer for you other than to really acknowledge that, the, that this is a dilemma for us as an industry. Uh, librarians are really always want to offer the best way to get to, these, uh, to get to these resources. But in fact, we may have to collectively work in a, maybe some slightly different ways that allows vendors to be able to innovate, uh, iterate on their products, but also find some collective common ground where we all agree that, well, this is kind of like we're going to say that this is the way to do it. You know, this is one way to do it. But there may be other ways to, to, to do it as well. I'm not sure how you can afford, uh, uh, you know, super leaps forward in some of this as the complexity of the problem grows. So, uh, first of all, let me say that we never move fast enough for our users, right? <laughs> as, as, as hard as we try, um, it is a challenge. But these four companies, these are big companies. We've we've got we've got lots of resources. So I, I don't see any huge impediment to continuing to you know resource these products in a you know in a meaningful way. And one of the things that uh, you know we've been involved in, and probably a lot of these uh, the other companies as well, that makes this easier is is actually um, the the cloud-based platforms, uh, Azure and, and AWS, they actually offer tremendous economies, not just economies in terms of pricing, but in terms of the tool set that makes it easier to actually develop, update, um, you know, roll, roll out new versions of products. So that's a, that's a really great, um, uh, that's really great tool set uh, and a really great movement within the industry that will actually allow us to uh, innovate more quickly. Just want to 
One thing that popped into my mind as you were asking the question is when I moved to the States about four and a half years ago, um, I started to become familiar with the, the different vendors, generally speaking, not <laughs> the library industry. And, and I saw a commercial with um, Verizon and Verizon Fios where they say they have the best TV. And then I saw a direct TV commercial where they say they have the best TV. And then I drove to work and then I heard that um, Verizon's offering with direct TV um, NFL mobile. And that got me confused a bit because I just heard them arguing a second ago. So I think, you know, to our example, um, you collaborate where it makes sense. You work together uh, for your customers when you recognize there's a need, whether it's a business need, whether it's a, just a, a community need. And then, of course, you can continue on your individual businesses when it makes sense. That, that's how, you know, companies work. I think you asked basically two questions, I think, in there. One was about uh, the company's resources and dedication to moving this thing forward. And the second was, and what will that mean to the landscape of the discovery providers? Will that be, uh, is there going to be four? Or will there be more? Will there be fewer? And how will that, and how will that sort of manifest as it relates to partnerships uh, and so on? And so the first, I, I think, from my perspective, I work for EBSCO and you know, I'm married to a librarian and I care about, uh, about libraries uh, very much so. And one of the things that's great about working for a company that is a privately owned company is they're, they're, they're rooted in seeing the benefits for libraries as we go forward. EBSCO's primary focus or mission is about producing and providing resources that are going to uh, benefit libraries in the long run. And so our goal is always there and the resources are there to make that happen. As a private company, there's no need to concern about um, what we do uh, in relation to um, stockholders and so on. It's really about investing back into the business to make sure that we're doing the right things at the right time in the right ways. Uh, and sometimes we take a wait and see approach to that to make sure that we're doing the right thing for the long run. Um, as far as what that really means, it means for discovery, it's a huge, uh, it's a huge investment overall. And to make these things work and work well and bring all this data together and do it the right ways, it, it requires, uh, it requires constant attention, it, requi it requires constant resources, and, and requires constant sort of innovation. Uh, and we're dedicated to that. Um, what that means as we go forward, uh, I think if you saw anything from my initial slides, partnerships are critical. Partnerships will make it so that uh, we can work together, work well within your organization for the things that you want to have done. Now, will that mean that all four of us will be sitting up here, you know, five years from now? I don't know. Maybe there'll be ten. Maybe there'll be two. I, I, don't, I can't answer that question. But I do know that as it relates to technologies and APIs and your infrastructure, we do have the ability to improve those if we come together as, as groups of individuals and groups of companies uh, to, to improve those services. So I hope partnership is bigger than, you know, content metadata sharing or any of the specifics here. That partnership can actually help us to, to improve services for libraries and end users. These discovery platforms, this is an incredibly ambitious project. It's technology, it's software, it's content, publisher relations. So it's not surprising that there's a small number of large organizations equipped to do that. So uh, will there be, uh, you know, when I write my annual reports, one of the things I look at is the number of resources that each of the organizations kind of has to bear on on product development and support and all of that. And these are the ones with, with kind of large numbers in, in those categories. Uh, you know, a small library company, a, a small group of libraries wouldn't have the resources to build, you know, this level of product. So uh, my observation is that this is not a surprising outcome that there, uh, that there are four and not 10 and not 12. Okay. Other questions? Uh, And there we go. Thank you. I work for the State Library of Arizona, and we are mandated to collect, as most state libraries are, uh, state documents and archive them. And archiving them means retrieving them, of course, at some time. We're not just archiving them for the sake of archiving them. I, I, we have, this is the problem we have. We get data from all state agencies in all kinds of formats, um, in all kinds of software and hardware formats. We still get them in floppy disks. 
We get them in, <laughs> in jump drives. We get them on CDs. We get them on those little tapes, uh, meeting notes and uh, stuff like that. We get them, we have uh, some of them in WordPerfect, for example. We have them on old OS that doesn't work anymore. And, if, and photographs that were good at that time, when we try to retrieve it with Photoshop or with any other photo software, they're all pixelated or they lose quality or whatever. And then in addition, we have 3D objects, museum objects that we have to um, also archive and preserve and protect. And um, when the user has a query that crosses all these formats, crosses all kinds of hardware and software, how are we going to create a user experience that is really that, en that encompasses all of this, brings to, uh, to the fore centuries of data and creates that, that experience seamlessly. How do you do that? And today's technology could be archival for uh, the next decade. So how do we preserve it? How do we try to retrieve it? Back put it in a format that is discoverable uh, for the next decade or next century. There's some incredible challenges. Um, some of them have to do with resource management and digital preservation, but it sounds like there is an element of discovery that we might be able to, to talk about you know, with the panel and, and the, the group in the room. Um, not quite sure how, you know, are you ready to say something about it, it looks like? Just one of the things I wanted to say is, first of all, University of Arizona is just starting a long-term digital preservation project. You might want to tap on that. Um, they're working together with Arizona State, Northern Arizona as well, so they are working as sort of a hub and spoke model to host other institutions for their digital collections. Might be useful to do that. I think um, discovery of what we call special collections is key. Um, and, and I think to facilitate that, a discovery solution needs to be, even when it, with its own interface, open enough um, to allow different extensions and add-ons and additional functionality to enable not just the typical books, articles, um, sort of traditional record-based content, but, but a little bit more hierarchical content, um, special collections, etc. It's something that we've worked on in the last year. It's something that we'll continue to work on in the next couple of years, especially as we have um, a key component of the Xlibris portfolio is Rosetta, which is a digital preservation system. Um, so we're definitely aware of that. We're definitely making continuous development in how we display those and make those discoverable. It's not going to be, uh, you know, by the end of 2015, you'll have everything working and it's <laughs> wonderful. But I again, it's a gradual process where we take different uh, scenarios, whether it's 3D elements, whether it's hierarchical collections, as I was saying, different kind of digital components and just embedding them in a way that's, let's say you've searched for in that, by the way, I, I'm not a, you know, whether we talk about single search box or tabular approach or scoped approach, but when you're searching for something, it can at least highlight, similar to the way, and I think even someone does it with the, with the spotlight. Um, when you're searching for something, even within the long list of results, you still have a spotlight of certain collections and um, materials that may be relevant to you, even though in relevancy they may be lowered. So there are, you know, different discovery tools that do address it in other ways. Yeah, I don't think there's any single good answer, but that, those were great points about that. Uh, you know, one of the things OCLC does provide, for example, is a, a digital collection gateway. So if you have an OAI compliant local digitized co collection, uh, we pick it up into WorldCat and then it gets exposed to the search engines uh, through Google, for example. And I think you, get, you have to look at it's kind of a multi-prong attack here that you have to think about when you get to the long tail. I think like those spotlight ideas are great ones. You kind of have to th like think through what your end users are trying to find, what you expect them to find. And if there's no good way, if it's not showing up, how, c how can you get it to the top? How can you pull it out in some, in some way? And I think the search engine traffic is a, is a great way because in many cases, the user has no idea that it's there, but on the search engine side, they can pick up some of those unique things that would never be found otherwise. 
And uh, if it's not in, in, uh, on the discovery tool, maybe a little bit more difficult, maybe um, uh, pushed down in, in, the, in the relevancy list. I, I, I'd mostly agree with, with, with Mike and Ito. There's a number of issues here. I mean, we can talk about, well, search technologies other than textual search, image search, facial search, for example. You know, which, which are here and will take a while to propagate into, uh, into the discovery tools. But to me, the, the biggest issue is, well, you've got this special thing. How do you expose it in the interface of these products so that people know that it's there? And that's really, that's really a UX challenge as opposed to a search or, or, or metadata challenge. And definitely, um, you know, something that I, I feel strongly about, I, I know that ProQuest does, and I, I think all, all us vendors uh, understand the importance of, uh, of UX and trying to, uh, trying to surface things that um, encourage the serendipitous discovery and, uh, and, and also in, encourage um, or, or expose specific library assets in creative ways. I think uh, first and foremost, it's uh, it's a matter of scalability. All those different documents that you talked about and where they came from is it does NISO play a role in something like that? Where how do we start to talk to those folks who are providing those materials and get them in formats and ways that we can actually leverage in the, in the greatest possible ways? When it comes to the discovery end, I think you know those special collections obviously they're special for a reason and they should be exposed. Um, we're trying to do that collectively. Uh, we've, we've done some things where there's non-textual uh, approaches or, or content. Um, we're building out a huge collection of apps that customers can you know, grab, build out on their own, and, and utilize within the, within the context of, a, of the UI and, and sort of provide that ability to put it in the right places in front of the users at the right time. And so um, we're trying to move toward that, uh, the, the idea of digitizing it all to begin with and getting it in formats that are usable. Uh, I think it's a quite, quite, the, uh, quite the uphill challenge. Well, let's move on to another one of my questions. Uh, and you can tell from my talk that I have a lot of interest in linked data as it's emerged as a key area of interest in library uh, resource management and discovery. Uh, does your organization see a role for linked data and discovery? And if so, can you describe how it fits in your development roadmap? I'll, I'll start that one. I, I should say, um, first of all, I get a little apoplectic when I, I hear the term linked data. Um, that being said, uh, I'm probably as guilty and ProQuest is as guilty of, of uh, you know, waving the linked data flag as, as, as anyone. Uh, and, and the reason it, it drives me a little bit crazy is because linked data is a, is a technology, well, it's not even a technology, it's data format, right? And by talking about linked data, we're ignoring really the, the real problems or the real things that we should be talking about, which are things like how do we expose the library collection to search engines so that it's more discoverable? How do we create bibliographic records that are richer and, and contain more information than is represented by, by Mark? And those are the questions that we, and of course, how, how, do we, how do we bring related information into the discovery process so that uh, we can encourage more serendipitous dis discovery? And, and to me, those are the questions that we should be asking, and the answer might be linked data or it might be some other technology altogether. So as an example, ProQuest has developed a new knowledge base and the new knowledge base is being hooked up to, to all our products, kind of as we speak. And one of the things the knowledge base was um, rewritten to provide is, is something like title history. So one of the issues is that titles are, are frequently dropped from database packages. And when they're dropped, oftentimes the, the librarian doesn't know that they've been dropped, you know, unless they get an email from uh, the company. And, they, um, and they're unable to account for cost per usage data because now that package is no longer part of the, the or that title is no longer part of the, the database package. So 
just as an example, one of the things that the new KB provides is, is this title history. You can get alerts when titles are, are dropped, and it, it maintains the um, uh, it maintains the the data for drop titles so that you can correctly get cost per usage, you know, even after the title has been dropped or, or changed. No, sorry. Uh, as it relates to linked data, I mean, certainly there's a lot, a um, lot of discussion, a lot of ideas, and still certainly in the in the early phases. But uh, w while we're sort of quiet on the EBSCO side, we are watching and listening and and developing and testing various ways. One of the things that we always try to do is consider discovery as in the broadest sense. You know, it is your entire collection. It may be the window to the world of your library for uh, users in a greater and greater way as we move forward. Um, but a lot of the linked data talk is around, you know, data coming from the catalogs, and what we think is there's a bigger world. So for, for years we've been working around, for decades, around authorities within the serials world, journal world, article level world, and you know, so we're thinking about it in a bigger context, you know, how can we, how can we leverage those sort of relationships um, in the bigger space of discovery as we go forward, so that's sort of how we view it. First, um, Steve, it's quite annoying. Um, it, it says so on my note, linked data is an enabler. It's the technology that allows yada, 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 and it's basically how you started. So I'm not gonna start with that as well. Uh, somewhat repetitive. Uh, but <laughs> I think um, w one of the things that's interesting, and, and, and Steve also raised it, is it doesn't have to be linked data. I'm thinking of some of the services we have um, that already leverage technology, like usage data. We have the BX article recommender. That once you find a re an article, it shows up other recommendations for people who use similar articles, similar to the Amazon model. We can even use call numbers uh, to virtualize the, the bookshelf, the browse, the virtual, you know, virtualize the shelf itself as they are on it to facilitate other close by sort of that serendipitous notion. So there are several components here. Um, it, it's not a technology, but it's related to technology. I think software as a service and multi-tenancy are two buzzwords that should be thrown out there as well. Um, we can't expect each and every individual library to take um, the task of moving their data or even creating their data as linked data. This is why you have the four of us here sitting. I think it's something that, as a platform, it's something that we should enable, um, much like any other, much like cataloging, it's not something that it's, it's native to the system. Um, such as linked data features should be, whether it's in, you know, we in here we're talking about discovery, which is again, how you connect the library data outside, but also we can look at resource management, whether it's cataloging in linked data, whether it's leveraging like the um, Biplo project from UC Davis of leveraging linked data when you're cataloging, sort of a complement to the subject heading. So there are different scenarios here we should continue and move, we should continue and deploy, but the concept of, you know, deploy once and have everyone enjoy it, I think is key. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of different ways to be able to use, you mentioned cataloging, I think that's a great spot where uh, it does add some value. Uh, you know, OCLC's worked with um, the commercial world, Microsoft, Yahoo, um, uh, directly, Microsoft, uh, on, the, on the linked data side because it's important that we're moving as a community towards what the greater commercial world might be doing, how they're consuming data, how they're using it. And uh, it is the case that in fact that there's a great demand for knowing about library holdings and that's one of the places that we started as a, as a company was to, to look at that way. So how we could actually get WorldCat holdings visible to, um, <coughs> visible to these uh, commercial search engines uh, <coughs> in, in, per in particular. We're also though, I mean the cure for me, it's always about the focus on, on solving the end user problem. Really, at the end of the day, it's how do we put the end user together with the resource that they're trying to find, and is li does linked data help you move down that field? And one of the things that you've, <coughs> if you look at the statistics in some, of these, in some of these systems, there's a lot of ambiguous searches that are going on. It turns out that a lot of users, it's, it's one, two, and three word queries, and in many cases, they're actually putting what I would call an entity in as the query. And it could be global warming, for example, or it could be a name. 
And these are places where linked data actually really does have a really big help. And we've spent an enormous amount of time. Now, all of this work at OCLC completely predates me by a long time. Uh, it was all new to me, like seeing what they were actually doing. But there has been a lot of thought and work going into it, especially in cooperation with third parties and with uh, services like schema.org to make sure that we're consolidating our efforts around uh, how best to be able to deliver uh, uh, good answers to end users. So, anybody want to pose a question? We have a hand. There we go. This way. Um, hi, I'm Robin. I'm a science librarian here at Hopkins. And um, my users have all, like, run away to Google Scholar and PubMed and have never looked back and don't care. So, <laughs> so my question is, have, the ven have you vendors thought about, are you thinking of moving to making your discovery product your primary product, and then how can you break it down, not into its individual databases that you used to sell us, but in some other way so that libraries can buy smaller chunks if for some reason they hear from their people that EBSCO does a little bit better in ancient Near East and you know ProQuest does better with whatever metadata they have with, you know, marriage and family issues in sociology. Or going back. Uh, well, it's right in front of me. I'll, ju I'll just s s take it first. Um, you know, so uh, one of the things OCLC has done, we, we definitely have a focus on, on a modular approach as much as possible. If you look at our list of APIs, there's 24 of them listed on our website right now. They run the gamut of, of uh, a uh, very l low level to uh, WorldCat search and soon uh, WorldCat discovery. So we make a big focus on being able to have, give you the ability to be able to pull things out and, and match and merge, and not to use the summon term, match and merge, uh, uh <laughs> you know, what you're trying to achieve on the other end. And in addition, from a business model perspective, we're, we're definitely from a buying decision point of view, making sure that people can make choices for pieces of, uh, of what we sell. You know, for example, we've got, um, you know, Seton Hall is one of our uh, world share management customers, but they use EDS as their, as their discovery tool. So it's like, and they're pretty happy with it as, as far as I know. So I think that libraries are gonna continue to make those choices. And I think as, as vendors, we've made a really big effort, I believe overall, to try and cooperate as much as possible to make sure that that, gets, that happens. Well, I, I would agree that cooperation is, is, is really important. I, I think as a, as a vendor, um, s sort of what you've, you've described is, is, is kind of difficult. I want a little of this, a little of that. Um, I think our, our approach is, is more oriented towards let's make sure that we have the content you need and then let's uh, provide options, whether they be you know, relevancy, uh, you know, different relevancy algorithms for undergraduates, graduates, PhDs, professional uh, faculty that allow people to find what they need uh, as opposed to sort of, you know, providing small digest digestible uh, chunks of our, our discovery engine. Uh, but the other point that I, I would like to make is that um, a couple months ago, ProQuest um, crafted an agreement with Google where all our content is exposed through Google Scholar. So, you know, basically our, our, our mission is to make uh, you know, our content, your content, uh, discoverable to, um, to researchers, to students, uh, you know, whether or not they go through the library front door or start with Google. I guess I would answer that in uh, two ways. Uh, first being, I think when you have a discovery service, the reason why the precision and the detailed indexing and how do we, you know, take, is, is really about did I solve that user's need did that user come? Doesn't matter if it was specialized, if it was everything here, but when they did that search, did they get those results that they wanted to get? So that's number one. But number two, when we build products and services, we do it with an eye toward flexibility and, and for you to take control of the services that you have. Uh, so for example, we do offer profile options within EBSCO Discovery Service. So if you have EBSCO Discovery Service and you said, you know, I want to make a, music collection and I want to have the 
UI have music all over it, and I want the link to the chat with the librarian to be these two music librarians, and I want to put these things up here and really pull the resources together in a, in a way like that. We can help you to do that. There's no additional cost for those services. It's another way to provide profiles. If you think about uh, it's you know from a, a consortia level or a group of libraries that go in together, how can I make this thing more my own? You can actually do that across disciplines if you choose to do that. Now again, that's really about the UI and about you know the services that you want to put in there. But again, if you go back to the top and say, hey, if this whole thing was together and somebody did some very specific medical search, did it work for them? And that's what we're trying to achieve. And I think folks think about discovery and they think, well, no, no, that's really watered down kind of stuff. Like, no, that's not the idea. We want this thing to be uh, an academic, truly deservant of being in your library, academic research experience for your entire collection. So, um, well, we do all of that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I, I have to tell you, I, I, it's hard, you know, it's not music to my ears, it, is that the word modular, which I'm not a big fan of, and the reason I'm not a big fan of is it, it brings out all connotation of you pay for each module and then the vendor charges you more. And I think one of the key concepts of unified discovery, unified resource management, is to sort of get away from that. So the, you know, from, I, I understand your, your concern that, you know, in your case, you're only interested in specific things and that is fine. And I think as, as Scott was saying, um, we need to be able to provide you with a clear interface for your patrons which you can teach them. Um, if you look at Boston University, they have two primos, for example. One which is the main library, the other one is for the law library which they chose to customize. So enabling you to do these kind of decision, choose how you slice and dice the information, design it yourself, I think is critical. Whether you'll convince the last of your patrons to use that, you know, let's leave it for next year. Um, but, but I think the, o the responsibility is on our side to at least enable you to get to that stage where you can teach them about it. So we have four minutes left. I guess that gives you one minute each if you want to say something very quick in closing. Uh, for libraries. Oh, uh, did you not hear like the last five minutes? They were brilliant. I just want to put it out there. Uh, <laughs> so, but, but I'm saying that we do need to make sure that the points of integration are there. They're available for every library uh, to actually look at, use, and, and understand what's suitable for them. It, it, there's no good, there's no right response here. The, there's simply a couple of approaches which vendors should support both. Yeah, I, I can't argue with any of that. The World Store Management, World Cut Discovery go hand in hand, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. I'd like to actually end with this thought, which is uh, Ranganathan's uh, fourth law, which was make it easy for the reader. And I have always loved that one because at the end of the day, 
That's what we're here for, is to make it easy for the reader. And I think that as we approach this uh, and the next, you know, the next few hours today and tomorrow, how we go about our business, it should really always be about that. How can we simplify it and take the complexity out of a, a, a library end user getting to what they really want to get to? Thank you. I would just say I, I think we're still at the very beginning of this discovery journey. There's a lot more uh, innovation, uh, both in user experience and search that remains to be done. And I, I just say I, I love um, both the customers and you guys keeping us honest and pushing us, the competition pushing us. These are, you know, four fantastic products. Um, and it's great to be working uh, actually collegially with, uh, with all these different companies. Great. Well, thank you. And um, thank you all for your time and, and, and uh, questions. Um, I'd like to also comment on the, uh, I think I started with the idea that things should be sort of open and bring the choice to you. I uh, thought I'd start with a, a little bit of an anecdote that sort of strikes me uh, in this vein. So I was speaking with uh, folks at a, a large university and uh, actually um, on, the, on the content and discovery side and, and they were talking about I was asking them, what, 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 are you, what are you into? What's going on in your library? What are the things that are really important to you now? And they were talking about the user experience. And you know, we're, we're studying the user. We're testing. We're understanding how they interact with our resources. Uh, and we really want to make it so that it's the best possible experience for them. So we're learning a lot. And the discovery tool is really where we're concentrating because more and more of the use is going there. And I said, how's it going? And they said, it was great. And uh, they were using a service. None of this was EBSCO services. And uh, they said, um, but we're changing, we're changing our ILS, and um, we're going to go with a different discovery service. Right? So I thought, I thought, well, I thought the other one was working well. I said it did. And I said, well, what made you sort of, when you evaluated your discovery service, what made you decide to change? And they said, now mind you, this was the AUL of content and discovery. They said, well, we didn't evaluate the discovery service. I said, what do you mean? They said, well, the ILS was chosen. And then we got a new discovery service, and we'll see how it works. And to me, that was, that can't be the way that we approach things. So for us, it is look really strong, look really hard at the services that you believe are the best ones, and we should be able to make those things work for you. The dollars and cents of it actually will make sense in the long run. Um, you, you, do, you do pay for the services that you, that you receive, whether it's a bundled solution or otherwise. And so I would just suggest that if you're sitting in a situation where you said, I didn't evaluate the discovery service, um, I would uh, see if you can get your trials, get that data, see it with your own eyes and with your own data, and make those decisions. Because in the end, that's where the users are going, and that's how they perceive the library, regardless of what you do on the back end. So thank you all very, very much for the time. I appreciate it. And thanks to all of us. Thanks. And thanks to all of our panelists. And uh, Todd, turn yes. it back over to you. Yes, many, many thanks to all of the panelists. And uh, all of the panelists represent uh, NISO members. So many thanks to your participation in NISO. And, and NISO is an organization, I, I think I tweeted this, and NISO is an organization that provides an opportunity for these uh, players to, pl to, uh, to work together in a collaborative fashion to address some of these issues. So uh, many thanks to your support of our organization as well as your participation and the, the various participation of your staff members in that. Uh, <coughs> now it's time for lunch. A couple more logistic details. Lin lunch is in the galley, the same place where uh, uh, breakfast was. You can either bring that back in here Obviously, we'll still be in here. There's lots of space in here. There's also space, since it is a little cramped, kind of like an airline. We're running out of space. Uh, there is space down the hall uh, where you can set up as well. It is also turning into a fairly nice day, a little bit on the brisk fall side, but still sunny and, uh, and uh, cheerful outside if you want some sun. You can sit down on the patio out either on the veranda or in the grass if you so choose. Uh, also, there were a lot of ideas coming out of this panel, out of Marshall's talk. Uh, we still only have two up here. We want to get some more ideas, some more things that you want to discuss. I think there's certainly some ideas that linked data being one, interoperability being another, that we could really dig into 
uh, during this conversations this afternoon. So take a few minutes, write down your ideas up here uh, so that we can uh, organize some panel discussions later this afternoon on some of these issues. So with that, enjoy your lunch. We will reconvene at 1 o'clock. So those of you on the live stream, we'll see you in an hour. <laughs>